Greetings, beloved, and welcome to On the Living Edge. I'm Dr. Mark Sharona, and I'm delighted that you've chosen to spend this very special New Year's Eve with me. I pray that God will enlarge, enrich, and expand your borders in the coming year. And I pray that as we move towards the end of this year and the next few hours, that you will finish strong. In this season, we've been preaching on blessing and the power of blessing. And tonight, blessing includes recovery and restoration. The word of the Lord is about to come to you in a very significant way. I want you to receive it as you cross the threshold from 2015 into 2016. And let's begin to be aware that with blessing comes restoration. Open your heart. Open your mind, open the scripture on this New Year's Eve. God's got a word for you. Deuteronomy 34, the first four verses say, Now when Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho, and the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead as far as Dan, and all Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim, Manasseh, and all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, and the Negev, and the plain and the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. I shall let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. We read that again. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. Moses tells us in chapter 1, verse 37, the reason he won't be allowed to go. It says, the Lord was angry with me also on your account, saying, not even you shall enter there. In Deuteronomy 3, there are six verses from 23 to 29, we won't read them now, where Moses pleads with God that God would change his mind and let him enter the promised land. But God says, no, you can't go. I want you to think for a minute about what it would be like to be Abraham and be called to take your only son and go to the place that God shows you and then discover it's a mountain and you have to make that long climb up that mountain knowing that when you get to the top of the mountain you have to lay your son on an altar and sacrifice him. It's got to be a pretty tough journey. As they're going up the mountain, Isaac doesn't say anything. He's willing, he's yielded, he's surrendered. And um, at one point, though, he says, Father, we've got the wood and we've got the fire. But where's the sacrifice? And Abram, Abraham in that moment has to answer him in a way that's truthful. And the best and wisest thing Abraham can say to him at that point is that the Lord will provide a ram. That the Lord will provide a ram. And some trips of mountains provide us access to ascent. But some trips up mountains where we believe we're going to ascend don't quite deliver when we get to the top of the mountain what we thought they were going to deliver. But here's the reality. Abraham got up to the top of that mountain and he didn't have to sacrifice Isaac. God did provide. There was a ram that was coming up the other side of the mountain while Abraham was going up this side of the mountain because God was just testing the faith of Abraham to see 
whether he would give up his only son. And because Abraham was willing to give up his only son, God was allowing a ram to come up the other side to pay for the sacrifice. There would come a day when on a mountain another son would ascend and pay the price. Mountains in scripture are always places of ascent. And remember, we're talking about recovery, we're talking about restoration, we're talking about God bringing breakthrough in your life, even at the end of a 12-month period where there's been a lot of warfare. And we're living in an hour of great uncertainty. We're living in an hour where we can't ignore the fact that we are in peril. There's great unrest in the nations. We're looking for leadership to tell us it's going to be okay. And... Um, God is waiting for his body to rise up in faith. Because God is still on the throne. But what do you do if you've given your whole life for a dream and then you discover that because of certain decisions you've made in your journey you're disqualified from realizing it. Imagine not Abraham going up a mountain, but Moses, who's ascended Mount Sinai on more than one occasion, has received the revelation of the tabernacle as a pattern of heaven and worship. He's received the Decalogue, the ten words on two tablets of stone. He has spent on two occasions 40 days in the immediate presence of the glory. So overwhelming is the glory that it shines on his face that when he comes down the mountain those who were not there can't stand to look at him because of the glory and he has to put a veil over his face while he talks to them. So he spends his whole life veiling glory because he's seen something. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that the sons of Israel could not stand to see the end of what was fading away. And if you misread the text, you will assume that the glory on Moses fading was ending. But that's not what it says. Paul says that they could not stand to see the end of what was fading away. So you have to know what is the end and what was fading away. Well, what was fading away was the law. But what is the end of the law? Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10, Christ is the end of the law. So what was on the face of Moses was the glory of Christ. And because the hardness of heart existed in the nation that it did, they could not stand to see the face of Christ on Moses. They made him put a veil over his face. They preferred the law to the glory. So imagine for a moment you are the one who has talked with God face to face. You've seen him in the glory. You have communed with him. You have communicated the eternal purpose and plan of God in type and shadow through the tabernacle, the approach from the outer court to the inner court, to the holy of holies, to the place where God says, tell the sons of Israel, I will meet them here from between the wings of the cherubim. Imagine what it's like to be the one whose rod has decimated ten princes in Egypt, principalities, and undone an entire nation's future by miracles, signs, and wonders. And that same rod was used for forty years in the wilderness to perform wonder after wonder, sign after sign. And when they came to a place where there was no water, there was a rock that was following them. And God told Moses to take his staff and strike the rock. And Moses obeyed God and took the staff and 
struck the rock and water came out of the rock. It's a type of Christ. The rock that followed them was Christ, Paul tells us. And so water came out of the rock, but then almost a generation later, once again, they need water. And this time God said, even though they've been rebellious, I'm going to satisfy their thirst. Speak to the rock. But Moses, when he gets before the people in his anger, in his frustration, he does not speak to the rock. He strikes the rock. And the transgression he commits at that moment in his anger disqualifies him from realizing his dream. His whole life boils down to a decision he makes in a moment of frustration where that moment he makes that decision determines that he will not be able to fulfill his destiny. He won't finish well. So I want you to understand that when God says it's time, Moses has to make a climb and go up a mountain. And in going up that mountain, it had to be the toughest mountain climb he had ever made in his journey. Because number one, he knew he wasn't coming back. And number two, he knew he was going to see what he could never enter. And he gets up to the top of that mountain, and it says God showed him. At the top of Mount Pisgah, God showed him the entire land on the top of Pisgah from Dan to Zoar. Moses climbed that mountain and God gave him a vision. And God showed him what the future of the nation of Israel was going to be like. And God showed him the land divided amongst the twelve tribes. And God showed him everything that was going to be part of the inheritance of God's seed. And once God showed it to him, God took his breath away. And he died this close to his breakthrough. He was so close, but he was so far. He was within reach of the thing he wanted more than anything else. And he died in frustration. Mount Pisgah represents those seasons in your life when you get so close, but the breakthrough doesn't come, and you are reminded of your faults, your failings, and the wouldas, the shouldas, and the couldas that keep you in regret, because at some moment you did something in frustration that you know grieved the heart of God and you are convinced the reason you can't have your breakthrough is because you messed up. Every one of us can produce a laundry list of why we shouldn't get our breakthrough. When the woman caught in adultery is thrown at the feet of Jesus. They're waiting for Jesus to say something. But he stoops down. He takes his finger, the finger of God, and writes in the dust. 
and he gets up. They're demanding an answer, and he says, okay, here's my answer. He who is without sin, cast the first stone. And then he stoops down again, takes his finger, and keeps writing in the dust. And by the time he gets up, the oldest accuser in the crowd, all the way to the youngest accuser, have dropped their rocks and left the scene. From the oldest to the youngest, from the oldest accusation to the most recent accusation, they're gone. From the one that can be remembered the longest to the one that can be remembered the freshest, they're all gone. Because Jesus stooped twice. First time he stooped was when the Word became flesh and he emptied himself and took the form of a servant. And with his finger, he wrote into the dust of Adam's creation a whole new possibility. But then, when he stood up, those accusers that couldn't get him in that situation falsely accused him three and a half years later. And so he stooped a second time and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And he took his finger and wrote in the dust of Adam's failure, it is finished and he stood up never to stoop down again I want you to hear me there's only one person that's ever lived that's finished well and it isn't Moses there is only one person that has ever finished what he started there is only one person that never died frustrated and that one is the author and the finisher of your story. He's the author and the finisher of your dream. He's the author and finisher of your breakthrough. And while you may have a list of why you can't get your breakthrough, and while the enemy may remind you, of things that go back a long way to things that you just did. You need to understand something. Moses couldn't go into the promised land. But it wasn't because he blew it. Oh, I know in his day and in his time he was disqualified for his anger. But he was the lawgiver. And Hebrews tells us, let me read it to you. For the law, Hebrews 10, verse 1, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, of the good things to come. Since the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make perfect those who draw near. The law can't make you perfect. The law can only show you how imperfect you are.
for finding fault with them, Hebrews 8, 8 to 10. Listen carefully. These are the words of God to a group of Hebrews that wanted to go back under the law because they were being persecuted, because their breakthrough hadn't come. For finding fault with them, he says, this is the Lord, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Moses is going to have to go up that mountain in faith, knowing he's this close, but he can never see the realization of his dream. He's going to have to go up that mountain in faith because he couldn't be made complete without you. Somebody in here tonight needs to hear what I'm telling you because you may feel like you're this close, but you keep falling short of your dream. But I came to declare by the name of the Lord that unlike Moses, you are not going to die in frustration. Your restoration, your recovery is coming. Your dream is going to be realized. Beloved, during this holiday season, may we remember God gave his greatest gift to us in Christ. And what we give back to him for the purpose of sharing the gospel of Christ is the gift that keeps on giving. I want to invite you right now to sow a generous Christmas love gift into the soil of Mark Sharona Ministries and join with me in continuing to get the imperishable gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ out through the media and the airwaves to over 180 nations so we can see yet more soul saves and hasten the coming of the Lord. Call that number right now and sow a generous Christmas love gift of $50 or more. And let me say thank you by putting in your hands this powerful, special series. I've never done one like this before. Six messages, your choice, CD or DVD, on Grace Gotcha's Ancient Blessings That Never Die. You'll want this in your library for the journey of your life because you'll want to refer to it again and again about the power to invoke the name of the Lord in every single situation and know it's going to have a profound effect as the highest form of prayer you can pray in the commanded blessing. Call that number now. Sow that Christmas love gift of $50 or more. For those of you that are moved on to sow a love gift this Christmas of $100 or more, I also want to include a very prophetic series called Vignettes of the Great I Am, covering four messages in the Gospel of John between Jesus feeding the multitudes, going up the mountain to pray, walking on water, and getting the disciples safely to the other side. It will cause your faith to explode in a whole new way for God's desire to bring you into a heavenly order where things multiply and you walk with him above the storms. Call that number now. Sow that love gift of $100 or more. And let me put both these resources in your hand. And for those of you that are moved on in this special holiday season to sow a love gift of $150 or more, you're also going to get beyond the series on Grace Gotchas and the vignettes of the great I am, a 15 ounce thermal mug with the invocation of the blessing of Numbers chapter 6, all fully included with my expanded paraphrase of what the word peace and shalom really means. It'll be a constant reminder of how you're blessed in your going out, blessed in your coming in, and it will serve to encourage you to stay in a place of being blessed and being a blessing. Call that number now, sow that love gift, and let me say thank you by putting these resources in your hands. Call now.